For many years, some Christians have held out hope that America would experience another wave of spiritual regeneration. But midway through 2020, anarchists and agitators, culture drivers, and even some politicians are openly advocating for socialism and the wholesale rejection of Judeo-Christian values. So which is it? Are we poised for revival or revolution? Stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our soon returning King, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. Those of you who are regular viewers can see that we've mixed it up a bit today. I'm Tim Moore, the ministry's associate evangelist, and I'll be hosting today's program. It is my pleasure to welcome my two <laughs> colleagues, Dr. David Reagan, our director and senior evangelist, and Nathan Jones, our internet evangelist. Fellows, welcome to today's show. Well, thank you a lot, Tim. And uh, folks, as you can see, uh, Nathan and I are in the hot seats. And that's because Tim was the one who came up with the idea of this program. So I said, okay, Tim, go with it. Here we are. <laughs> all right. And I'm so glad we're covering revival. One of the main questions that we get into the ministry all the time is, will there be a great end time revival before the rapture of the church or not? And so I'm glad we're covering this. Well, Dave, thank you for the opportunity to host. It's quite a privilege and an honor to do so. And so let's get right into it. We have a very heavy topic for today, revival or revolution. And let's break it down. When we look at the condition of the world today, the church, even in the United States, do you see any evidence that we are on the brink of a revival? Well, let me quote you a Barna poll that came out in March of 2020. In 2000, 45% of American society believed they were practicing Christians. They went to church, they read their Bible regularly, they were involved. In 2020, this year, it's down to 25%. Now, those who call their unaffiliated or nuns are 21%. So, we have almost as many people who say they're irreligious as we do people who are practicing Christians. The only upside of that as Bible reading is that for 93, 1993, and then again in 2020, it's still about 35%. So, we're finding that church people are leaving the church and doing their own home studies and their own things. But overall, Christianity is continuing to decrease in numbers here in the United States and, of course, decrease in influence. But does that mean that we're poised for an explosion of evangelism? We are a mission field right here at home. Is that an opportunity or a possibility you see evidence of around us today? Dr. Reagan, what do you think? Well, I don't think there's any possibility for a revival, none whatsoever. And the reason I say that is because the Bible says that in the end times, right before the coming of Jesus, society is going to completely disintegrate, and it says that the church will be filled with apostasy. There is not one prophecy in the Bible about a spiritual revival in the end times. So, the crucial question is, are we in the end times? And I think beyond a shadow of a doubt, when you look at all the signs of the times and you see how they've all converged, that we are definitely in the end times, that we are in the time when the season of the Lord's return, and there is not one single verse in the Bible that indicates any kind of revival. The only verses that I've ever seen uh, have been primarily primarily from the Old Testament where they quoted verses that had to do with the millennium mm. that did not have to do with the end times. Okay. There are some New Testament verses that people will use, uh, but I don't think they're valid. Okay. Nathan, any thoughts? Well, there's two conditions in the end times. There's one, the secular world, and you can read that in 2 Timothy 3, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, and it goes through a long list of sins. And then you can go to Revelation chapter 3 and look at the final phase of church history, the church of Laodicea. And the church is defined as apathetic. Uh, they think they're rich financially, but spiritually they're very poor. So, you've got a condition as the church continues to become more apathetic and have less impact in the world like the Barna poll showed, you then have an increase in people believing that they're their own gods, and then exhibiting all the vices that we read here in 2 Timothy 3. Jesus Himself said that He was going to come back when <clears throat> society was like it was in the days of Noah. You go to Genesis 6 and see what the society was like. It was characterized by two things, violence and immorality. All over the world today, not just in the United States, we have societies characterized by immorality, increasing immorality, and increasing violence, particularly because of terrorism in the world today. So, uh, you know, we are living in the season of the Lord's return, and I just 
Uh, one thing I would point out is that there are some major pastors in the United States whom I greatly respect, I mean greatly respect, who are teaching that they believe that as the result of all of this stuff that's happening to us there will be a great revival. And I can understand that from their pastor's heart. And they, everyone without exception goes back and they talk about all the great awakenings that right. occurred in American history uh, when, when we grew cold in the Lord and then there was a great revival. But the point is that we haven't grown cold in the Lord. We have turned our back on the Lord. We've kicked Him out of our schools. We've kicked Him out of our public arena. We have become a secular pagan society. Society. We're not cold in the Lord. We are militantly hostile toward the Lord. And God is getting ready to pour out His wrath on the, In fact, He's already started. Yes. Uh, with, uh, with the perfect storm that we have right now. Just think, it's a perfect storm in the sense that we have this tremendous medical calamity. We have an 8,000 point drop in the stock market. We have the collapse of the economy. And we have violence in the streets. It's a perfect storm. It is a perfect storm. Well, not to disagree with any of you, because obviously I agree that we are living in the season of the Lord's return. The signs of the times are manifest all about us. But there are individuals who will point to passages like Joel, chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. And they'll say, well, Joel promises in the Lord through Joel that it will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. Obviously, it says on beyond that, your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. And I will pour out on male and female servants my spirit in those days. And they say, see, that's still a promise for the outpouring of God's spirit. Well, Obviously, for, Peter quoted that passage in Acts. Yes. And, said and, and if then. you read the verses before that, there's two important things. It says there's going to be two outpourings of the Spirit, the early rain and the latter the rain, latter which rain. refers to the rain, two rainy seasons of Israel. And it also and and the early rain was at Pentecost. The latter rain will be in the end times. Now, notice that the verse starts out by saying, and after this yeah, is what is. Well, after this is after the reestablishment of Israel, if you read the preceding verses. The reestablishment of Israel occurred on May the 14th, 1948, exactly almost one year later in 1949. Uh, uh, an evangelist in Los Angeles who was holding a tent meeting took off like a rocket, and uh, suddenly the world found out about Billy Graham and this great. Evangelism occurred all over the world. That was the uh, that was the beginning, I believe, of the latter day pouring out of the Spirit. We have been in it since then. We are at the end of that period, not right. the beginning of that period. I concur completely. Nathan, any thought? Yeah, just like Dr. Reagan said, Acts two seventeen, Peter quoted Joel saying that this is the time at Pentecost you're hearing these miraculous things happen. We're not supporting that the Holy Spirit has cessated through church history, absolutely not. The Holy Spirit continues to do the work of salvation and provides miracle gifts. But it, it seems to indicate in Joel that as we get up to the second coming of Jesus Christ at the end of the tribulation that these miraculous gifts will increase. And so we got to differentiate then between the rapture and the second coming. Yes. Leading up to the rapture, all these dreams and vision stuff? I don't think so. I think those are dedicated to the outpouring, as Dr. Reagan said, during the tribulation time period, that seven years when God will judge the earth. Okay, so if we don't see any evidence, and if God's Word doesn't support any thought that there will be a widespread revival, I'm talking national or on a global scale. Obviously, in individual lives, there is that opportunity always. We'll touch on that in a moment. But if there's not the likelihood of a revival, then what about revolution? Obviously, when we as a nation revolted back in 1776, it was against the tyrannical reign of the King of England. That's uh, documented in our Declaration of Independence. But if we are talking about another shoe that is to drop, is America on the brink of a revolution? And if so, what are we revolting against no, today? We're not on the brink of a revolution. We are in a revolution. We are revolting against God and against His Word. The apostasy in the church today is absolutely, totally appalling. Look how fast the church and even the evangelical church has flipped on the issue of homosexual ordination, homosexual marriage. It's like there's no verses in the Bible that condemn yes. this. It's just unbelievable. One of the most popular apostasies being taught in the church today, even by some evangelicals, is the idea that there are many different roads to God. After all, we've got to be tolerant. And we've got to understand that, you know, uh, the, uh, the Muslims have their road, and the Jews have their road, and the Hindus have their road. And that is absolute nonsense. And it makes Jesus a liar when He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and I am the only way to God. Amen. We have to look to what the Bible prophecy says the end game is. What is the end game in the tribulation? It's a one world government ruled by a man of lawlessness who promises to bring peace to all the chaos. So the world has got to get 
more chaotic, uh, more wars and rumors of wars, more of the signs that Jesus gave in Luke 21 that point to a destruction of organized society and a rebuilding it in the Antichrist image. So uh, America is the biggest impediment to the world trying to destroy Israel right now. And we're seeing this kind of crossover as the church gets weaker and Israel gets more prominent, that eventually the church will be removed. And then when you talk about revolution, then all hell will break loose. And that's how the Antichrist establishes I want to kingdom. emphasize how far and fast we've come. In the year of 1999 I wrote this book and it was published in the year 2000. And the book was titled, Living for Christ in the End Times. And the subtitle was, Coping with Anarchy and Apostasy. And the publisher refused to do that subtitle. He said, that's too radical. He said, we're not facing anarchy and apostasy. I said, we are. He said, no, we aren't. So, he gave it, the, you know, publishers have absolute control of the cover and what the cover says. So, he gave it this incredible subtitle, Be Balancing Today with the Hope of Tomorrow, whatever that means. I, that's <laughs> goobly gop. So, in 2015 I decided to jerk the copyright from the publisher because I owned it. And we published this book again, a revised edition in 2015, and we put that on there, Coping with Anarchy and Apostasy. And I think even then people thought that was a little radical. I don't think anybody's thinking that's radical no, now. No, I don't think so at all. You know, I've been writing lately about uh, Saul, King Saul as opposed to David, the first and second king yeah. of Israel. And it's interesting to me that the Lord Himself described the reason that the Israelites were clamoring for a king. He told Samuel, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. Mm. And of course, he anointed Saul to be the first king. But later, as Saul disobeyed the Lord's commands, the Lord said very clearly, I'm rejecting you as king because you have not obeyed my commands and you have rejected my word. And so, whether it is talking about revival or this revolution that we are talking about mm. right now, America and even the church is not so much rejected the, the thought of Judeo Christian values. We've rejected God Himself. And his very word. And that pattern continues to this day. And we are very clearly in the throes of a revolution, not just what we witness on the streets in 2020, but the heart of man which is turning against the Lord God, even in this formerly Christian nation. And Samuel's, oh, go ahead. Samuel's a type of church, too, because his children were spiritually unfit to lead the nation of Israel. So when the nation lost confidence in their theocratic leadership, they wanted to go to secular leadership. And I think we're seeing that in the United States and around the world today. People have lost faith in the church. Well, Alexander Solzhenitsyn said that there was one reason that the Soviet Union suffered 70 years of communism. We forgot God. Mm. And he said the same thing to us in the 1970s. I can see that you're following the same trail. America has forgotten God. And he said, you're going to suffer the consequences. What an indictment and a warning. Well, folks, if we concluded the program at this point, the sense of doom and gloom would be overwhelming. And that's arguably why some people avoid studying Bible prophecy. They are overwhelmed by the foreboding it conveys. But there is hope in the midst of horror. We'll take a short break and then discuss the glorious hope that can be yours. Hi, I'm Tim Moore. Many of you watching the Christ in Prophecy television show have been blessed by the teachings and information we've presented for years. Did you know that Lamb & Lion Ministries also produces a bi-monthly magazine called The Lamplighter? Every other month we publish a magazine filled with articles related to Bible prophecy. We highlight cultural trends and make observations about the current events of the day to point people to our soon returning King, Jesus Christ. If you become a Prophecy Partner, you'll receive the magazine automatically. If you're not a Prophecy Partner, you can receive the electronic version of our magazine at no cost. Or we'll be glad to mail a print edition to your home in the U.S. for an annual donation of only $25. Just call the number on the screen or go to ChristinProphecy.org to learn more. You know, Psalm 119.105 says, God's Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I hope you'll consider receiving the magazine that will shine the light of God's prophetic Word into your life. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy. Tim Moore has been leading our discussion about whether we're destined for revival or revolution. But as we closed our first segment, he hinted at hope in the midst of horror. So, Tim, what in the world do you have in mind? Well, Dave, we've already established the very tragic state of our society today, but throughout our discussion we focused on what Bible prophecy had to say 
about the day of the Lord and what is in store for mankind in God's master plan. So, as Paul Harvey would say, let's talk about the rest of the story. <laughs> so, if revival is impossible and revolution is inevitable or already underway, what is an individual to do? In other words, I would submit to you that instead of focusing on those very gloomy scenarios, we should focus on God's glorious revelation about the future. And again, not revival or revolution, but revelation. What say you? Well, let's look at the prophet Jeremiah. If anybody was watching a country fall apart and get torn apart and taken away into exile, uh, it was the weeping prophet. And he says in Lamentations 3, and he's, he's going through all his and troubles. after the thing has been destroyed. Yeah, Israel's destroyed. The nation's gone. And he's, he's weeping in, in the dust. And he says, This I recall to my mind. Therefore I have hope. Though the Lord's mercies are not consumed, because His compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I hope in Him. I hope in Him. You he's know, Tim, uh, every time I uh, get the feeling down about what's going on, I see society falling apart. I see apostasy growing in the church. The one verse I go to that gives me great hope is found in Psalm 2. Psalm 2 begins by saying that all of the leaders of the world, all the political leaders, the kings and princes and so forth, are all conspiring against God and His Anointed One. That was written 3,000 years ago by David, yes. and it's still true today. But it says in Psalm 2 and verse 4 that as they conspire against God, God sits in the heavens and laughs. And laughs. Not because He doesn't care, but because He has it all under control. He has the wisdom, He has the power to orchestrate all the evil of mankind to the triumph of Jesus Christ. So, we have to remind ourselves God has got it under control. That Amen. gives me hope. It certainly does. And I, I love examples in the Bible. I love to find exemplars, men and women who demonstrated great faithfulness even in the time of tragedy or calamity or great threat to their own lives. I always think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who in Daniel were threatened with being thrown into a fiery furnace. And their response to King Nebuchadnezzar was, O King, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blaze fire, and He will deliver us out of your hand. But even if He does not, we will continue to serve Him. I'm paraphrasing that last phrase. And so, we don't have to worry about the circumstances that surround us if we've put our faith in Christ. So, when I refer to God's revelation, I'm obviously talking about His entire Word revealed in the Old Testament and New, the Holy Bible itself. It's a wealth of information about His master plan, as you've talked about, Dave, for the day of the Lord that's approaching for the, the season of the Lord's return, the end times in which we're living, and it does provide examples of godly men and women. But we also have a book of the same title, Revelation, that contains Jesus Christ's own personal testimony about the things which must soon take place. I'm quoting from Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. And in chapters 2 and 3 of that book, you mentioned earlier uh, one of the churches, but he dictated letters to seven different churches with specific promises to believers who overcome. So, I'm going to ask you, we've touched on this before, but just to settle today, what is an overcomer, and how are we to overcome the present darkness that is closing in on our culture and our country? Well, an overcomer is defined for us in the New Testament. In 1 John chapter 5, uh, it says uh, point blank that an overcomer is one who has put his faith in Jesus yes. as Lord and Savior. And we will become an overcomer with Him just as Jesus is an overcomer. And every promise in the book of Revelation is made to overcomers. But you know what? Before we get deep into Revelation, I want to go back to the previous question you had but okay. where you talked about hope. Yes. I, I think we need to talk more about hope uh, because we have a great hope. For example, in Isaiah 43, God says, When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And though the rivers, they will not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. God is going to walk through with us through the worst possible times. The Bible is full of passages like this over and over that give us tremendous hope. And of course, the greatest hope 
that a Christian has right now in midst of all this is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 beginning with verse 13 where it talks about the rapture of the church and how Jesus is going to appear in the heavens and be a shout of an archangel, the blowing of a trumpet, the dead in Christ will be resurrected and those of us who are alive will be taken up and translated on the way up from mortal to immortal. And it says at the end, therefore comfort one another with these words. Those are great words of hope and comfort. They certainly are. I think of Habakkuk who was given a revelation of God's uh, judgment that was about to be poured out on his nation. And, and Habakkuk was taken aback, as we like to say. <laughs> but sure was. he was despondent. He just couldn't believe all the horrors that were about to ensue. And he prayed, Lord, in wrath, remember mercy. And I always think the Lord must just have been shaking oh, his he head. He must have because, been thinking his yeah. yeah, really, the Lord is the definition of mercy. And so even as we are about to enter a period, the world is, of unprecedented wrath. The Lord always offers mercy to those who put their trust in Him. And I love the way Habakkuk ends because after God's told him, I'm send, bringing the Babylonians, they're going to completely destroy your nation. He thinks about that for a long time and then he says, well, here's where I am, Lord. I will exalt your name. I will rejoice in you, the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He has made my feet like hinds feet. He makes me walk on the high places. He says, even if you destroy all the food and all the cattle and everything else, I'm going to put my trust in you and I'm going to hope in you because I know you're a God of love and goodness. And the Lord affirms that hope and that trust by saying, the righteous will live by faith. faith. Exactly right. We're not to live by our feelings. No. If we live by our feelings, we're going to get in trouble oh, real fast. <laughs> they're very fleeting and uh, false. But there's some prerequisites. You have to be a Christian. Uh, go back to 1 John 5. It says, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him and has begotten him. So we have to love him. It goes on to say that we have to keep his commandments. In other words, what's his great commandment? To accept Jesus Christ as a Savior, love God and love others. And uh, forever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And so, mm. we're talking about belief in Jesus Christ as Savior, to be His child. We're talking about loving God and obeying His commands, go out and preach the Gospel, and to remain in faith. As you just read, the just shall live by faith. That's the definition of an overcomer. Robert Jeffers, the pastor of First Baptist Church, always comes down hard on this point. He says, you know, there may not be much hope for our nation, but let me tell you what, there is hope for individuals. Amen. Anyone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ. And he says that's one of the things about this dark period we're in right now. As it gets darker and darker, he says the light of Jesus shines brighter and brighter, and more people we can bring to the Lord if we focus on preaching the gospel and not preaching social justice and things like that. Exactly right. Well, what are some practical ways? Let's say the folks watching today are already believers and they see all the doom and gloom. What are some practical ways that Christians can overcome the fear? and the apostasy of this present age. When I was growing up, you don't hear this this hymn anymore, but I used to love this. One of my favorites, kid. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Oh, Do you all remember that? Oh, I love that. I'm not much of a singer, but it goes, Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. You know, when you're looking at the majesty and wonder of God, then all this nonsense, this chaos, these troubles seem to fade away in the light and glory of God. We take our eyes off God and we get kind of focused on our daily activities, our trials and tribulations of life, and, and we start panicking. It's like a child who his father's teaching him to ride a bike. You know, you're always secure when dad's hands on the back of that seat, but eventually dad lets go, and, and then we get scared and we fall. We, we take our eyes off God, and that's when we begin to kind fear. Kind of like Peter walking on the water. <laughs> and the scripture says he saw the wind. Well, what he saw. <laughs> <laughs> was the effects of the wind, but when he took his eyes off Jesus yes, Christ, he began sinking. to sink into Absolutely. the waves. Good. Well, agree. Tim, that's what my book is all about, Living for Christ in the End Times. I was, is practical things that we can do uh, to cope with anarchy and apostasy. And what I've done is written a chapter on each one. And what, what I've said is st you stand on the Word of God, you believe in the power of God, you rely on the Holy Spirit, you practice tough faith, you order your priorities, you keep an eternal perspective, you stand for righteousness, you persist in prayer, you surrender in worship, and you cling to hope. Amen. Dave, the things that I summarized even as I was preparing this, uh, this conversation was that we should study the Word of God, the revelation of God from beginning to end to understand its promises, to become well versed, if you will. And you we can't should, emphasize that enough because there's a famine of the Word. There today. is a famine of the Word. And again, from beginning to end, not just the, the proof text for the things that we have preconceived, but the entire 
gospel from beginning to end, the entire Word of God. We need to pray without ceasing, and all the more as we're in this time of darkness. We need to determine not to quench or to grieve the Holy Spirit. And I think that's something Christians should take much more seriously as He would endeavor to work and shine the light of, of truth through us. And finally, I love what you said, Nathan, keep our eyes on Jesus. Not only to receive a blessing, those who are looking for His return are promised a crown of righteousness, but also to motivate the very evangelism that you speak of, to ensure holy living, and to make sure that we are vibrantly expectant of His return. And all I can say is amen and amen, and add one thing to it. Do not put your hope in politicians. No. Politicians will always disappoint you. The Republican Party is not going to save this nation. The Democrat Party is not going to save this nation. That doesn't mean you don't take a stand and you don't go out and vote and you don't take a stand for righteousness. But don't put your hope in that. Don't put your hope in the Supreme Court. We've, we've oh. put our hope there. And now justices get on there and they change and they move from right to left and start making all. We've got to put our hope in Jesus. Well, uh, there's a lot of talk about faith these days, and some people have faith in faith. And our hope is not merely in hope, but if we have already established today that revival is unrealistically optimistic, and revolution is realistically hopeless, in other words, it's very realistic that it's happening, but it only leads to hopelessness, Christians are not people that are mere optimists or realists. We are people of hope, and not just hope in hope but hope in a blessed hope, in the blessed hope, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, amen. and amen. Yeah. Well, folks, our hope is not in societal reforms, as Dr. Reagan said. It is not in dodging revolution and national self-destruction through one more election cycle, even though we must stay engaged as salt and light in the gathering darkness. Our blessed hope is in the person and the promises of Jesus Christ. He is more trustworthy than any system of man. He has revealed His master plan for the culmination of human history, and all three of us pray that you have already placed your trust in Him. Amen. Well, folks, that's our program for today. We hope it has been a blessing to you and that the Lord willing, you will be back with us next week. Until then, this is Tim Moore for Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, Look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. If you want to understand why God has allowed this pandemic to ravage our nation and destroy our economy, you need to get a copy of my book, God's Prophetic Voices to America. The book provides the background, both historically and biblically, for an understanding of why our nation has been subjected to the current pandemic. The book begins with an in-depth but down-to-earth and easy-to-understand analysis of the way in which the ungodly philosophy of secular humanism has taken over the educational institutions of our nation and has spread from there to every aspect of our society. I then show how God has responded to our increasing secularism and materialism by raising up prophetic voices to call our nation to repentance. Next, I proceed to present summaries of the messages of those prophetic voices, all 13 of them. Those people include four from the past and nine who are currently speaking out. The voices from the past include Peter Marshall, David Wilkerson, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and Francis Schaeffer. The current voices include people like Don Wildman, Jan Markell, uh, Albert Moeller, and Jonathan Kahn, among five others. This is a book with a very urgent and vital message that both you and your pastor need to read. The book normally retails for $20, but because of the pandemic emergency, we are making a special offer of it for a gift of only $10 or more, including the cost of shipping. You can place your order by calling the number on the screen, or you can place your order through our website. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus. 